Well, I think everyone listening to this will know about calling out because it's a culture that we have all fallen into. You know, I'd be curious if anyone listening to this thinks they have not fallen into it somehow. It's in many ways the culture of social media in particular, but obviously metastasizes beyond social media. And it's a culture of, you know, yelling at people, uh, of finding any way in which someone has committed an infraction and and going wild on it. Um, it's a culture of kind of not taking people aside and saying, hey, quietly, hey, you know, you might want to think about what you said in the meeting, but instead going straight to social media and dumping on someone you like uh, and admire and work with, but feeling an obligation to dump on them publicly at lest you be held complicit. Um, I have certainly participated in call-out culture. By the way, I think call-out culture is also very effective for certain things. There's elements of which, you know, uh, I think if you look at um, the the rising cries for racial justice around the world, um, the old approaches of trying to work within the system were quite ineffective. And so calling out abuses of power and things like that, very useful. You know, I think a lot of women have found their voices calling out patriarchy and sexism in the workplace in ways their mothers and grandmothers didn't have the tools to do, and it's been very effective. So there's a lot of power in calling out also. The problem is when our democratic discourse becomes dominated by trying to kind of dunk on people instead of invite them into a, the better tomorrow that we want. And so I write about Loretta Ross, who's a veteran racial justice, reproductive justice, gender justice advocate in the U.S., in her 70s now, been an activist for more than 50 years, really a kind of godmother of the movement for so many people, and has the credibility. No one thinks she's a moderate or a milquetoast, mushy middle person. This is a serious, serious person who has fought serious fights and lived hard realities to, to seek the world she wants. And in recent years, she got very alarmed by this call-out culture, and she says, you know, the antidote is call-in culture. And she defines a call-in as a call-out done with love, which is to say a call-in is not not calling out. It's not keeping mum. It's not ignoring the patriarchy or the, or, the, or the racist thing that you saw at work. It's calling out with love. It's finding ways to invite people in to a, the world you want. Now, it's very important to make distinctions. There are some people who are militantly racist and militantly this is their ideology they they they're making the comment at work because they actually believe women are the second sex like and you have to be clear who those people are and you need one strategy for them loretta says and then there's a lot of other people who simply were not socialized in gender equality and are a little too old to have gotten the memo in time when they were malleable and there's a lot of white people who honestly never thought about race until they were 40 years old, right? And now suddenly it's everywhere and there's trainings and there's TV shows and they're a little bewildered, right? And there's also people who want to like burn churches because, you know, and, and I think in some ways, Loretta calls this threat assessment, that progressives have gotten bad at threat assessment, making the distinction between the person who wants to burn down your church and the person who doesn't understand what the term white supremacy means, or the person who makes an awkward comment at work about women versus the person who wants women back in the 14th century. Um, both are problems, to be clear. Both are problems. But they're different kinds of problems. They're different scales of problems. And this former group of people who are confused, bewildered, don't quite get it, we need them in our movements. We don't need them dr we're driven to the other side. And we don't really want them standing outside in the rain, banging on the door, getting frustrated no one's coming in, and eventually drifting away into the night. We want to pull them in. We need movements that are self-confident enough to pull you in, even if you don't know the terms, even if you don't get it, even if you say slightly awkward things. Movements self-confident enough to educate you inside, in our spaces. You don't have to be perfect on your own time uh, to only then come in. This uh, broadcaster asked me in response to my own statement of unbelief. He said, I insist that you answer the following question and that you answer it with a yes or a no. I braced myself, I accepted the challenge unseen. He said, you want to imagine yourself in a strange city where you've never been before. You want to imagine nightfall coming on and you to be without friends or succor in this town. And you, to, you are to ask yourself whether you would feel safer or less safe 
when you saw a dozen men coming towards you in the dusk, if you were to know that they had recently come from a prayer meeting. <laughs> this is the, I'm, 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 I think I can justifiably say, I'm re relaying to you, comrades, friends, brothers, sisters, the challenge that was put by the religious to me. You'll see at once it's not a yes, no answer. You can't give a yes, no answer to that, but I accept it anyway. I said, very well, I won't give a Sesame Street reply, but just without leaving the letter B, I have been in that situation in Bombay, in Belfast, in Beirut, in Belgrade, in Baghdad, and many other places too. And I won't tell you about all of them, but let me just, let me just as it were, fill in some of those uh, latent uh, blanks. Um, in Belfast, the capital city of one of the provinces of this, our United Kingdom, as everybody here knows, everything, culturally, educationally, economically, politically, socially, has been very gravely retarded for at least a quarter of a century, excuse me, at least half a century and maybe more since partition, and before that, because partition is both the uh, outcome and the cause of sectarian warfare in this town by the simple fact that there are people there who are willing to kill not just one another, but one another's children on the basis of what kind of Christian they are. Horrible things are done, not just in pubs and clubs, but on the streets, on housing estates, uh, on university campuses uh, in that city still, despite the relatively good news we've had uh, today, where the situation remains dominated by barbaric sectarian party leaders, on this and no other basis. Uh, both churches demand that their children are sent to separate schools. They each agree with the other that above all things, their own children must be protected from the faith of another faith. Uh, I don't think I need to elaborate very much more on uh, how horrendous the consequences of that have been and how they are enshrined by the way, in our own constitution, which mandates that our own head of the church is uh, also the head of the state and of the armed forces. Um, with all the ludicrous Windsor consequences that you get if you found a national church on the family values of Henry VIII. <laughs> These conditions, which are farcical in England, Wales, and Scotland, are tragic and ugly, only a few minutes flying time from where we sit. If I pass on from Belfast to, say, Baghdad, where I've recently been, and without reopening any of the arguments about the rightness or otherwise of, of the coalition intervention in Mesopotamia, I think it can be granted by any fair-minded person that what was most needed in Iraq after 30 years of fascism and war was a period of reflection, a, a, a short interlude of calm during which Iraqis could look about themselves and decide perhaps whom they'd like to vote, perhaps what kind of country they'd like to live in, what kind of federal system they might wish to evolve, uh, and to do so unmolested by violence or terror. The parties of God have vetoed every hope of that process. The parties of God now have the Iraqi people in their jaws, and they're saying to them, it's not enough just to kill foreigners or to rail against Jews uh, or Christians or secularists. That's nothing like enough. Uh, it's it, only in Iraq, uh, not only, mainly, chiefly in Iraq, that it's considered perfectly all right, in fact, a, a religious duty uh, to blow up the mosques, to destroy the religious schools of other Muslims, of the Muslims of another school, not unlike the pattern of Belfast. It's not enough to have faith, you must have the right version of your own faith, or risk death, mutilation, and humiliation, and the, the destruction, the, the immiseration, the torture, of Iraqi society is something that all of us can read about every day. Suppose we're to go to Beirut, uh, the pearl of the Levant, uh, the most civilized and, and beautiful and cultured uh, city of the Middle East and to see what happens when for, for politicized reasons a sectarian constitution is in place which says that the president of, of Lebanon must always be a Maronite Christian, that the speaker of its parliament must always be a Shia, that its vice president must always be a Sunni, that the Druze must have their share, and so on, leaving out at the very bottom, I'm afraid, such forces as 
Kurds and Armenians, but making everyone defined in their citizenship by their faith. Don't jinx it. Uh, as we Muslims say, don't nazar me. Don't give me evil eye. I need to put food on the table. I need guests to come on my show. But it is a, it's a question a lot of people ask. Um, when I did Eric Prince, mm. a lot of people ask, why did Eric Prince come on your show? And I often, explain who he is. Eric Prince is the former CEO of Blackwater Mercenary Company. It's the, probably one of the most viral interviews I've ever done. It actually got, ended up with him getting referred to the Department of Justice for a criminal investigation for alleged perjury because I called him out for uh, contradictions in his testimony. And people said afterwards, Eric Prince, this re Republican Trump-supporting mercenary, why would he come on your show? And I, I said, I don't know. If I was Eric Prince, I wouldn't have come on my show, but I'm glad he did. Thank you, Eric Prince, helped my career a lot. Um, I don't know why people come on the show. There's a mixture of reasons I can only speculate. Some people, like John Bolton, they just enjoy a row. Bolton's been debating since Yale University. They're very uber confident in their own abilities. And I respect that, it's good, let's, let's do it. I like people you know, who wanna have a good argument in good faith. Um, some people are ignorant. They don't do their homework. They don't know anything about the show when they turn up. I did a, and some colleagues of mine from Al Jazeera English here tonight, I did an interview with a senior government official from a country I won't name who came on a show I did, and as they sat in the, I could see them, in, it was a remote interview, and I heard them say to an aide, what is this show, who's this host? Right. And I was like, you really should have asked that days ago before you turned up to do the interview, and surprise, surprise, that government then complained to Al Jazeera and the Qatari government afterwards. So, ignorance, arrogance, some people are just on a book tour, so they sit down for any interviews. Um, <laughs> It's become harder as I've become uh, slightly more well-known in the US. Being at Al Jazeera English gave me a certain anonymity uh, in an American audience at least. Um, but yes, it's become much more difficult. It's also become more difficult, Johnny, because the people I really want to interview, some of these kind of right-wing crazies, are so crazy I don't actually want to give the, put them on my show. There's a chapter that's not in the book, which is when do you not have an argument? When do you walk away from an argument? Mm. And I, you know, I'll interview John Bolton as repulsive as I find his politics. Because I, I know that he believes what he's saying. I don't think he pretends to support the Iraq war. He genuinely believes that mm -hmm. was the, he thinks it was the right thing to do. He doesn't think he did anything wrong. And he's clearly an intelligent person, even if I don't like him. But would I have like a Marjorie Taylor Greene on my show? No, because I just, election deniers, no. Climate change deniers, no. Holocaust deniers, no. Just, I'm not gonna argue reality. I'm not gonna argue up mm. is down, black is white, hot is cold. That stuff I won't do. But people who are willing to come on in good faith, even if they haven't done their homework about me, yeah, bring it. But as you said, more and more people are doing their homework and people, will, you know, the show has a reputation. Yeah. And I'm wondering if, if in a way, firstly, they're gonna shy away from coming on your show, but also whether that one of the sadnesses of the current polarized state of particularly American life, but I think it maybe exists in other places, is that the kind of old school debate that you embody and that you yeah. relish is happening more and more rarely. Yeah. So that actually people are in their silos speaking only to their yeah. political family. Yes. Um, and very rarely are they colliding with the opposite camp. And in a way, well, it's, you know, it's been great for you, but you know, you're part of that because you're on MSNBC. Most of the guests on MSNBC are not John Bolton. Yeah. They're actually Democrats interviewing other Democrats, yes. liberals interviewing other liberals. It's all very cozy. I mean, your show stands out as something of an exception, but do you think it is a sort of endangered form and that the network you work for is part of the problem? So it's definitely an endangered form, and I, but I don't think the part on the network, is, I, I'm not so cynic because I'm employed and they pay my bills, but genuinely, I, 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 kind of, I kind of get, I get frustrated with this, MSNBC's liberal, Fox is conservative, cable's divided America. America's divided for many, many reasons, well beyond cable news. And oh, it's also, a symptom, not a cause. It's yeah. a symptom, but also, I don't hide the fact that I do an opinion show and I'm on a network that's considered liberal left, that's very different to Fox. Fox is not a news network. Fox is a propaganda organ, and you don't have to take my word for it. Just check out the leaked emails and depositions from the Fox Dominion case that's going on right now, where Rupert Murdoch admits under oath that his hosts were lying and they endorsed a big lie and maybe they shouldn't have, where you know, Fox hosts are texting each other saying, well, T Trump's lawyers are crazy and this stuff is mad and our viewers, they believe this stuff. You know, I tell people, you can loathe everything I say on my show, but I guarantee you, I say the same thing in private. So I think the best argument for porn is not the sexual liberation argument. I find that very unpersuasive. The idea that people just ought to have some sort of human right to have access to the most sort of 
varied and depraved sexual acts you can imagine being performed by strangers at you know at the click of a mouse i don't i don't find that persuasive we lasted however many hundreds of thousands of years as a species without access to online porn i think we can probably cope um the the probably the strongest argument and it's sort of an empirical argument and i haven't yet been persuaded that it's true but this would be be, if it were true, this would be the best argument in favour of porn's availability, is that it um, decreases sexual violence, that there are men who, if they have access to porn, are less likely to go and assault women offline. I mean, I don't, if, if that is true, I really don't love the idea of having these sort of sacrificial lambs, women in the porn industry, who are you don't sort think of it actually up as red meat. Well, that's the big question. So it's an empirical question, and it's just really, really hard to answer. I think it is unlikely that that is true. Because if you look at things like the way that porn has changed sexual cultures and sexual tastes, so choking is the big example, mm -hmm. or strangulation more accurately, it used to be a niche within a niche, you know, basically you don't hear about it within the BDSM community, which, ex which was extremely marginal and was mostly dominated by gay men. Now, however, it's on the front page of every major porn platform and all these shocking statistics about how many um, women in their teens and 20s have been choked by partners, often without any kind of um, warning, you know, yes. Um, I think that has clearly come, that's a fashion that has been cultivated by porn. It is to some extent feeding off um, sort of latent um, sexual interest in both men and women, but it, but it hasn't just shot up in popularity spontaneously, right? It's clearly an effect of porn. So I think the more likely, um, answer to the empirical question of what what effect porn has on people is that it molds both male and female sexuality mm -hmm. to this hyper 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 capitalist mode basically mm -hmm. that we're they, we all become sort of mm -hmm. in hoc to whatever the executives of mind geek want us to be watching yeah. and i mean i know from teenagers having talked to them a lot at university and done various articles on it that the girls will say that they're being vanilla if they don't agree to various acts yeah. and that they feel that they are dull and boring and they are expected to perform in certain ways and Mary do you feel that that I mean that's not just not progress in many ways it's very sad that women don't think about their own enjoyment in sex as much as what they're achieving for men do you think that's that's part of it as well is that they haven't I got do. the confidence I do I mean pornography is clearly a big part of what's what's happened here I mean it's like I think the thing which get which sometimes gets misunderstood about porn is that it's not it doesn't just it's it's not just a set of images it's not a static thing it's a, it has a it has force and direction in the sense that a stimulus which you might watch and find arousing um will wear off after a while and so anybody who consumes a lot of porn will start watching something relatively innocuous, you know, two two people at it, and before and then after a while that just doesn't do it anymore. So they go looking for something more intense, and they look, go looking for something more and more intense, and the 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 whole process eventually <clears throat> inescapably leads people down these sometimes really dark rabbit holes. And you know, obviously there's there are then the performers who are who are incentivized and sometimes coerced into performing. Um, you know, in order to create this increasingly extreme content, but there's also there's also the the, the effect it has on on young people. Um, in in terms of in terms of how it shapes men's and women's desires, it very clearly affects them differently. In the sense that you know, most pornography is produced for male consumers, and it's produced you know with a sort of grotesque caricature of the male gaze, and because it has this force and direction in, into increasingly uh, intense stimulus um that 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 tends that tends in the direction of increasing violence increasing objectification increasing degradation bluntly um and for any young woman who's exposed to even a small amount of this material it's going to shape her imaginary as well and inevitably that means seeing herself from the man's point of view in which which you know if you consume enough talk in enough of this material means you end up just more or less unable to imagine yourself as actually enjoying it or, or only as able to imagine enjoying something which actually in practice in person is horrible and violent um, and these and I mean, same there are... young women there's often i think the same young women will say that actually they should be allowed to wear what they want and act how they want and um drink what they want and i know louise you've got a list of things that you shouldn't do as a woman if you want to stay safe but that would be seen as fairly provocative by the younger generation 
do you think they have to start looking at this in a different way? Uh, yes, it has been seen in there. It's fairly provocative. Although, um, although I should say, actually, I have been uh, amazed by the response that I've had from young women. I mean, the book has been read, as far as I can tell, by just about every demographic. Um, but I wrote it really for young women. I wrote it really the book I wish that I'd had when I was 18. And um, it has had an enormous response from those women. And the thing that has really struck me as someone who is, so I'm now 31, so I was a little bit... Um, a little bit too old to be properly online. You know, we didn't get smartphones until we'd, um, we're just about to leave school and we're in university, which, which, which does hugely affect things like your exposure to porn. Whereas the younger generation obviously have grown up with it and they're the guinea pig generation. Um, and it amazes me how, um, how cowed girls are, many of them by this and how many girls will, will, I say girls, I mean, you know, age is sort of, um, up to the age of maybe 25, will say, I didn't know this. I didn't know that you were allowed to object to casual, uh, cultural casual sex. I didn't know that it was okay to say that actually choking really wasn't something you wanted to do. You know, that on the one hand, they're bombarded with the consent message, which says you must consent to everything. It's a yes or no, very clear sort of situation. But there's really no conversation about the huge gray area between you know, legal consent and, and virtue. And they find actually negotiating that space almost impossible um, because they don't feel as if they actually have permission to defend their own interests. So one of the things that um, I hope to do with the book and seem to have done at least with some readers is to, um, to offer that permission to say actually it is okay to gatekeep your body and to prioritize your own um, comfort over that of other people. It's something that young women find really hard very often. Uh, this is not simply, is there going to be a candidate? I don't believe that the elections are going to be organized if Putin is running, uh, that uh, he's going to lose the elections. But for the first time, President Putin is going to be challenged, not so much from those who said, why did you start this stupid war? But also those who are saying, why you are not winning this bloody war? So for the first time, the criticism to Kremlin are coming not simply from the liberal sources, but also from a much more extreme nationalistic position saying, OK, you started, but why you're not winning? And this creates a moment of vulnerability. It also creates a moment of vulnerability because Russian population was kind of quite ready to live with the idea of the special operations, something like the large version of Crimea, uh, where basically the Russian army goes, succeeds in several weeks, and the people are just going to cheer it in the way you're cheering as a football team. But now you have a mobilization, and probably you're going to have a more mobilization, and probably there are going to be more than half a million young men that are going to be thrown uh, to the battlefield, and many of them are going to be killed. This is a different social contract. And from this point of view, President Putin is vulnerable and he should try to find a way to explain to the Russians why this war is taking place. Of course, his major narrative is that he's not fighting Ukraine, he's fighting the West. But if he's fighting the West, what is the victory? And in my view, this story to explain the people what is a victory and why they should suffer is going to be very difficult. And this is why the election campaign is a moment of vulnerability. And my feeling is that the Russian uh, uh, leaders, uh, Russian leader knows very well this. And when we think about what leaders are offering their people, Zelensky is popular, of course. Uh, he didn't flee, he stayed, he's leading day by day. But at the same time, he's limited in any change he can offer. I'm, I'm, I assume that it's going to be very hard for him to say, look, we should talk to the Russians when facing re-election himself. Totally. And from this point of view, it's very important that for Ukraine, first, it's very important to organize the elections. And listen, it is not easy. You're organizing the elections in a country in which the majority of the population is not living in the places in which they have been living in the day the war started. Some have been emigrated, are they going to vote? Some have been moved because of, uh, of occupation and uh, uh, because of the distractions. So first, and it's critically important for Ukraine to show the infrastructural capacity to organize the elections. And secondly, uh, of course, President Zelensky is very popular, but President Zelensky is very popular because he's telling his own people, I'm not going to go on any compromise. I'm not ready to do any type of a territorial concession. 
The moment he said, okay, let's see what kind of concession I can do, be sure that there's going to be another candidate which is going to run on the elections and saying, no, this is not what we have been talking about. You have told to the people that we're going to liberate all our territory. And this makes me believe that for the same reasons we discussed about Russia and Ukraine, for both countries, it's going to be very difficult first to have any meaningful negotiations in 2023. And secondly, there is not good even possibility for the conflict to freeze in 2023. Because in the elections in 2024, to a great extent, are defining what is possible and what is not possible. And of course, what is happening on the ground is the most important. And in the wars, what is deciding decisive is really uh, 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 what uh, uh, the armies are doing. But this kind of a very important constraints may it's very clear that President Zelensky is under strong pressure to stay where he is and to do what he has promised to do. And to be honest, this is also true uh, for President Putin, who is insisting we are winning, this is our land, and so on. And obviously, he's not winning at the moment, but he should try to convince uh, his own population that he's doing this. So I'm saying this because this type of a perspective from the elections is not going to tell us what is going to happen, but probably is going to help us to understand what is not likely to happen. I was reassured that when there was concerted pressure from the younger generation, but also from uh, the people, potentially even the local governments, um, that uh, such a uh, you know such a such a, a long term kind of or or steadfast policy was broken. It shows that there are mechanisms. This is a very important point that there are mechanisms embedded in the systems, uh, whether it's from the people and social media or the competitive mechanism within the Chinese government that makes it so that preferences are still revealed and potentially shape the outcomes of political and economic decisions. Now, of course, that is the ongoing challenge as the Chinese government has to manage a much more complex society going forward, not like the time when I was born and everybody was content with having a growing income. Today, it's increasingly complex. But this new generation, young generation, overturning a key policy was more positive for me. But we also forget... But, the, but you said the preferences revealed. I mean, they were revealed by people demonstrating on the streets. It wasn't a particularly sophisticated polling exercise. Absolutely. But it's a two-way monitoring system. And social media creates that kind of platform, uh, not only for the Chinese government to uh, to watch what was happening on the ground, but other way as well. And I think that um, basically um, the, the, the complex... Well, anyway, let me start over. Um, I think the complexity of the society is a big challenge for the Chinese government. And they do listen. They do listen. Now, I still think the o ongoing challenge challenge is how do you have the political mechanism to include the much more important participants of the economy, like the private businessmen, the entrepreneur, in that system. If they don't do it and they don't adapt, the system is not going to be as powerful or will uh, enable the Chinese dream's aspirations that it has laid out. Yeah. And you use the phrase the Chinese dream, it's one that Xi Jinping uses and he talks about the great rejuvenation of the Chinese people. But I know some economists worry that she is so statist, uh, as they see it, that he's in danger of killing that entrepreneurial spirit. And they point particularly to the fate of Jack Ma, who was the, mm. the icon of, of mm. Chinese business, appeared to say something or do something the government didn't like and is now, as far as we know, sort of teaching students in Tokyo. Um, he's called back now. <laughs> oh, oh, really? Is he? Yeah. Well, yeah, well, t well, tell me yes. first what you made of that episode, but also what, more broadly what it said about the government's relationship with the most dynamic business elements in society? Well, the first thing to note is, broadly speaking, there can be a coexistence of seemingly paradoxical and irreconcilable uh, things in China. That's something that perhaps a Western audience ought to keep in mind, and that no policy is permanent and they're constantly being fine-tuned. So the pretext of this is uh, under the umbrella of common prosperity under President Xi, how to achieve equitable growth. But I think um, more may perhaps what the audience can relate to is that uh, in Xi's view, China doesn't want to be uh, like the U.S., highly uh, a, a high growth, a great economy, but highly inequitable and uh, 
politics sing to the tunes of corporates. China wants an olive-shaped income distribution, narrow on the ends and fat in the middle. It wants the corporates to sing to the politics, uh, to sing to the tunes of politics. And so um, this initial dramatic sweeping regulatory clampdowns and technology companies that had consequences for personalities and private uh, businessmen uh, uh, such as uh, Jack Ma uh, was, of course, a devastating blow to the economy because of the confidence issue. Um, how However, it wipe a trillion dollars off the stock exchange. Yes, it did because extraordinary. Yeah, figure. because of American investors didn't couldn't make what was uh, was going to happen to the yeah. private entrepreneurs, and that's all very understandable. Now, that's a painful lesson for the Chinese government: understanding that whatever they say, their intentions, their ambitions have real economic and immediate capital markets consequences. That was not the case in the old playbook, which was economy built on industrialization. In the new playbook around innovation and encouragement of entrepreneurs, they have to have credibility and commitment. Something the Western government struggled with for a long period of time. To learn now is the learning process for the Chinese government. However, that said, now you see that in the recent past, in the recent last few months, the state has rolled back some of these heavy blows, invited Jack Ma to come back, and there's a lot of luring private businessmen and trying to restore that confidence. Because guess what? Today's China's economy, the private sector is firmly in the driver's seat, and they do the heavy lifting of the economy. Unlike during the financial crisis of 2009. They call on Team China, state banks flush with cash,、uh, and state-owned enterprises、uh, splurging on infrastructure, and you get the economy back going. That no longer longer works. So even if the West believes that there's a statist approach of President Xi and control on the SOEs, the reality is that pretty much. Everything about the economy is driven by the private sector, and the government keen, is keenly aware of that.